As the world mourns the former UN Secretary General in Ghana preparing to lay Kofi Annan to rest, we've been joined by the UN representative for the West Africa and the Sahel. Also, he is the man to speak with that universe. He is a lawyer, a politician, an academic. Ibn Chambas is my guest. Doc, welcome. Thank you very much. How are you doing? We're well, good. It's always, it's always a, pleasure a pleasure to have you. Under the circumstances. Mm. Mm. It's, we're not so happy uh, because we lost a doyen of international politics and diplomacy, Kofi Annan. Kofi Annan, how did you know him? Well, um, I had the opportunity to meet him uh, when I was uh, still in Ghana, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and one of my visits to New York, I was informed that there was a very senior Ghanaian at the UN headquarters. So I asked that appointment be made for me to pay a Ketsu call on him. And from that first encounter, it was just uh, very good, good chemistry and bonding, and he encouraged me uh, to reach out anytime I was in New York. And you know, so subsequent visits, he would uh, invite me out uh, for lunch, for dinner, you know, and um, that's how it all started. And then, of course, uh, when he decided to run for the position of Secretary General, um, I was privileged to be certainly one of the first uh, Ghanaians that he well, mentioned. What role did you play in his, in his race or interest to become Secretary General? Well, I, I was very central to that whole campaign because uh, early on, um, one of the contenders mm -hmm. uh, who happened to be a foreign minister of neighboring Cote d'Ivoire okay. had uh, also uh, been interested and uh, he had dropped me a hint that um, uh, Kofi wanted to see me because okay. um, uh, there may be some indications that he might not have the full support of uh, the government. Mm. And so uh, when I met uh, Kofi, he did indicate that uh, he would like my advice how to go about this uh, campaign mm. and that uh, uh, his colleague, his friend, uh, the Ivorian minister, mm. had hinted him that he had picked up some signals that uh, he may not have the full support of the government. Okay. I disabused his mind of that and then I advised him to come home mm. uh, and then some meetings were arranged here and uh, of course uh, he got the full endorsement and then a campaign team was put together, uh, which uh, essentially I led at that okay. point. Okay. And um, the rest, as they say, is history. Mm. <laughs> so he was a mentor for you. No uh, question at, about at, that. At the UN. Yes, yes. Would you say that his life in the public domain, in everybody's eye, as the, the, the doyen of peace mm. across the globe, mm. was the same thing that he had behind the scenes? He was a very peaceful person by nature, very calm disposition, very gentle, very courteous. And that's the thing that endeared him to so many of his admirers, including, first of all, those who worked closely with him. He didn't distinguish between a senior person, low-level person. His approach to every person who worked with him was the same. It was one of respect okay. and dignity and allowing everybody to approach him and to be able to put across their views. Did you ever see him angry? Um, on occasion, um, you know, he, he was uh, somebody who wanted things done thoroughly. Okay. And he wanted, you know, and also um, uh, done in a timely fashion. Mm. I recall in particular one time, right here in Accra, okay. uh, when during one of the uh, Ivorian peace talks, mm. Uh, there was a delay, you know, uh, these processes uh, can drag on. Absolutely. And especially at the end of the day, mm. when uh, everything was concluded, and yet the final communicate was being delayed. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I saw him at that point uh, uh, a bit agitated, but he was not one to uh, blow into a tantrum or anything like that. But you could see that he was feeling frustrated that uh, maybe the document was not being produced at UN speed. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Let's talk about his legacies. Yeah. Um, top three, which ones do you Top remember? three, without a doubt, the agenda for peace. Okay. 
This was a document that uh, when he assumed the secretary generalship, mm -hmm. he initiated and appointed a very respected another African uh, uh, diplomat, Algerian Brahimi, okay. to review the entire approach of the UN mm -hmm. to peacekeeping. And they came out with this document, the Agenda for Peace, which put heavy emphasis on prevention of conflict. That the UN should not just be about deploying troops, mm -hmm. that it has to be a more comprehensive approach. It has to be a continuum. You look at what do we do to prevent peace, outbreak of conflicts. And when they have broken out, what can the UN do to facilitate quick mediation so that things don't blow out of control? Of course, if they do, and we have to deploy troops, even the deployment of troops should not be strictly just a military uh, approach, affair. It should be a comprehensive, to have a civilian component to, you know, to see how you work with women, with young people, in that context of deployment of a, a peace mission. And then, uh, when the fires have doused out and things that, not to just pack and leave, okay. how do we make sure we sustain right. the peace by at least initiating, engendering some quick impact and quick and, development. And that plan is still in place. And it's still very much uh, the approach in the UN now. Which, which are the other two that you remember? The other two would be his entire role in the area also of working with regional organizations. Okay. The AU. The, and the, all the ECOWAS. ECOWAS. Yeah. I mean, I was privileged to be at the ECOWAS when he was Secretary General. Mm -hmm. And he placed tremendous emphasis on let's build capacities of regional organizations. The world has become complex. The UN cannot solve all the problems. So if we empower uh, organizations that are close to conflict areas, they take the initial initiatives. And then, uh, for instance, in Africa, let the ECOWAS be first to see what it can do. Then the AU comes in, then the UN. And this synergy is really appreciated. The third area mm -hmm. is in the area of development right. and human rights. Uh, Kofi's view is that the UN should work on three pillars. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, the peace and security. Secondly, the development side, because there's an inextricable link between peace, security, and development. If one is not there, the other is likely to be undermined. But there's a third pillar of human rights, okay. justice, democracy. You know, when you are able to create an environment in societies where there's rule of law, democratic governance, then you eliminate sources of conflict mm -hmm. and crisis and uh, issues that likely are likely to trigger Interesting. conflict. Interesting. Kofi Annan has been eulogized across board. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have world leaders eulogizing him mm -hmm. in many different forms and words. Mm -hmm. For the average Ghanaian politician, especially mm -hmm. because he comes from Ghana, sure. what lessons can we draw from his life? The politics of insult, the mm. politics mm. of vituperations, the mm. politics of lies and deceit, mm. Mm. the politics of promising one thing and not doing. Mm. What can we draw from Kofi Annan's life? Yeah. There's just his uh, approach to issues, his humanity, his humility, um, and yet all of that is also undergirded by you know, competence in whatever he takes on, uh, respect for people that uh, he works with, and a uh, clear vision, a perspective, which commits one to always put the people and the interests of the people at the center of all efforts, all endeavor, all public uh, efforts. Do you think there would be a replica of a Kofi Annan on a Ghanaian political landscape? Well, the lesson of Kofi Annan is what? That out of very humble beginnings in Kumasi, Bontu, you know, normal, regular Ghanaian family, he rose up to become Secretary General of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. This shows that there's tremendous potential in, in this country, and um, certainly, uh, and I mean, let's face it, I mean, already Ghana has had uh, several people, uh, persons mm -hmm. in all walks of life who have distinguished themselves. They, they ought, like Kofi Annan, to inspire our young people, our women, our youth, uh, to, to realize that uh, indeed we do have a country with a lot of talented people 
and we should always work to, to harness and to allow them to blossom. If you look at the dual politics in this country, for example, NDC and PP, um, do you think that we will have the aura of Kofi Annan, you know, being imbibed in these politicians so that they will prosecute our politics with a different kind of tone and attitude? Do you see that happening? Well, one always hopes that events like this we then allow us to focus on a legacy of a great personality, you know, uh, a doyen of uh, diplomacy, international politics, as you yourself has called him, uh, will let us all step back a bit, reflect some more, and see what each of us can pick from their exemplary life. And that's what I would hope uh, should happen, so that it's not all about mourning and grieving, which is all legitimate. Uh, but beyond that, uh, you will see in the coming days leading up to the funeral, the international attention, uh, the outpouring of uh, uh, sympathies and condolences, but also the visitors that Ghana is going to host coming from all over Africa, all over the, the world. I can tell you that, and this is for the first time in the UN uh, headquarters, at the Secretariat, individuals who just want on their own mm -hmm. to come. And so there's a lot of pressure on the staff association to facilitate uh, many, many staff who want to come. And so it's not only the high and mighty, mm -hmm. but you know, honorable, ordinary people low low well. who worked with him and who truly admired him. So we as, as a people, uh, and especially uh, our political leaders, mm -hmm. Uh, our diplomats have a lot that they can learn from this uh, extraordinary uh, person that Kofi Annan was. Let's backtrack a bit, Doc, to his legacy. Uh, you spoke about his legacy of peace and trying to prevent conflicts and all of that. Mm -hmm. Kofi Annan has been heavily criticized for the Rwandan conflict, the genocide in 1994 that claimed many lives. Our own General Anijo was there. Do you think that criticism holds water? No, it, it doesn't for the simple reason that uh, 